1938, Ducks Unlimited Canada began protecting and restoring Canada's wetlands. Today, our work is more critical than ever. Our science shows wetlands give us clean water, they store carbon, and they help offset the impacts of our changing climate. Protecting wetlands protects us all. Our wetlands, our future. A message from Ducks Unlimited Canada. Great. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the third Ducks Unlimited Canada Marsh Masterclass, The Plight of the Pollinators. It's great to see all of you here tonight. We have a great evening in store for you with our guest speaker, Dr. Jim DeVries. So I recognize many of the faces and names uh, so far this evening, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cynthia Edwards. I'm the Director of Major Gift Programs for Ducks Unlimited Canada and also work as the Senior Development Manager cross-border with our wonderful partners across uh, North America in DU Inc. and uh, DU Mexico. So just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. All of you are on mute. Uh, we do that so that we don't get the feedback. Many of you have gotten used to Zoom calls. Uh, we have several breaks for questions throughout the presentation tonight. If you have a question, please use the chat box to either type your question or let me know that uh, you wanna ask it directly so we can unmute you. Also, we are recording this event. I'm obligated to let you know that so that you're all on your best behavior, of course. Uh, Jim, can you bring up the puzzle piece slide? I can. I think I can, uh, just, just one second. That's okay. There, that should be it. Great, thank you. I think, just a second. Nope, you're good. There you can see it, okay. Great. Yep. Great. Well, I just wanted to kick off again by thanking all of you uh, taking a piece of uh, your busy day to spend with us today. Our philanthropic donors, our major donors like all of you, are critical, uh, a critical piece of our conservation puzzle. Your investment in Ducks Unlimited Canada and the work we do not only helps us directly, but also enables us to leverage funding from state and provincial partners, as well as federal governments in both Canada and the U.S. It's also really important when we approach uh, foundations and corporate partners to know that we have that private philanthropic investment. So thank you. All of it starts with people like you, people who've invested in our conservation work and you really help drive this conservation machine. Sterling Adams, a former DU Inc. president once said, conservation without money is just conversation. And although we're looking forward to a great conversation tonight about a very important topic, we all know that it's our really our conservation work on the ground that motivates us and helps uh, move all of us forward in terms of conservation efforts. So we have a real treat for you tonight about a topic that's generating a lot of buzz across North America, the plight of our pollinators. Now, unless you've been off social media altogether for the last few years, and I couldn't really blame you for doing that. You've heard something about the loss of pollinators and the impacts that's having on not only the ecosystem, but the economies that we all depend on. We're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Jim DeVries with us this evening. Jim is a research scientist with Ducks Unlimited Canada and is based out of our office at, near Oak Marsh in Manitoba. He's originally from Alberta, but like all of the cool kids, like me, Spent a lot of his time on a farm in Saskatchewan growing up. Jim received his Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Biology at the University of Montana, his Master's at Oregon State, and his PhD uh, back home at the University of Saskatchewan. Jim has been with DU Canada for 28 years, and I've known him for almost 20 of those years already. Time sure flies. 
Uh, much of Jim's work at DU Canada focuses on designing and conducting research to evaluate our habitat conservation programs for Waterfowl and Prairie Canada and constructing biological models to aid in our program delivery. And all of that, of course, requires communication back out to the staff and our donors and supporters, like all of you. Tonight, Jim is going to focus on our pollinator research and how the work that we do for waterfowl benefits these important species. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Jim. Okay, thank you, Cynthia, and, uh, and, and welcome everybody. Um, thanks again, Cynthia, for including me in the group of cool kids. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been uh, <clears throat> part of a group like that. Uh, so, as Cynthia mentioned tonight, we're going to talk about the plight of pollinators. Uh, you'll see from my title slide here, which I believe you can see, um, I have kind of expanded that a bit to include other beneficial insects as well, because they really, uh, the two, you know, pollinators and beneficial insects really go hand in hand in the uh, agroecosystems that we, that we work in. So uh, just by way of an outline of what we'll cover tonight, um, First, I'll just talk about pollinators, uh, some of the different kinds and other beneficial insects, what they are, uh, how they operate. Um, get into some of the uh, issues about what the concern is with these species and some of the potential causes. At that point in time, we'll take a bit of a break for questions, um, review anything that I've uh, presented to that point. We'll come back, we'll talk about uh, what some of the prospective solutions are for pollinators and what the relevance to Ducks Unlimited is. What's the intersection essentially of these two, two issues? Um, and then we'll get into some of the ongoing research that we're working on uh, right now and have been for a few years. Another break uh, for more questions at that point in time, <clears throat> come back and get into some of the results of our work and really what it means to, uh, to Ducks Unlimited and how we will use that uh, as uh, uh, to inform kind of our work for waterfowl uh, and pollinators. So, can you still see my screen? Yep. Sorry, I just lost my screen for some reason. Okay, <clears throat> um, well, what are pollinators? Uh, I, I believe everybody is probably very familiar with the, the honeybee. This is really the uh, iconic pollinator that often uh, uh, everybody is exposed to in media, etc. Um, an interesting factoid about the, uh, the honeybee is it's not native to North America. It's, uh, it's the European honeybee and it was introduced to, uh, to North America back in the, back in the 17 or 1800s. Um, and it actually competes uh, for nectar and pollen with native pollinators. So um, that's something to, to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, you know, of course, the obvious benefit of honeybees is they have a huge economic uh, impact in our uh, uh, current uh, uh, society with not only honey production, but also it may not be known that honeybees basically pollinate the entire almond crop that uh, is grown in California, for example, plus a lot of our uh, fruit crops that are grown in the Pacific Northwest <clears throat> and Western Canada. So. Um, but that's the one that most people are familiar with. Uh, honeybees, I would say, are probably the next most familiar one. Uh, these guys are, are pretty, uh, they're furry, they're cute, they're big, obvious. Uh, everybody has probably encountered them. A lot of species uh, people don't really know about. Uh, for example, uh, honey or uh, bumblebees, there are about 46 different species of bumblebees in North America. Uh, but in North America, there's about 4,000 species of bees of all types. And I'm just showing a couple more here. The green one is a sweat bee. Uh, there are a whole bunch of species of sweat bees. And there are also leaf cutter bees. And again, a whole bunch of species of leaf cutter bees. So <clears throat> they're, uh, uh, in most cases, they all uh, serve pollination functions as well. Uh, but there are a lot of other species that serve as pollinators, um, from moths to butterflies. And, and then we even have bee, bee mimics. Uh, these are actually flies. Uh, they're a different, uh, different family. Um, 
They, they have two wings rather than four, which all of the bees have. And these are hoverflies. Uh, and they actually, part of their life cycle is in wetlands, but they are very important pollinators, especially in agroecosystems. And even species like beetles. Um, there are several species of beetles that, that serve very important pollination functions. So it's quite a diverse group of uh, species, more than just the, uh, you know, the honeybee that a lot of us have, have uh, talked about or, or, or know. Um, <clears throat> Grading over into beneficial insects, uh, there's a couple of different types of beneficial insects. And why are they beneficial? Well, number one, uh, there are, many of these are predators of agricultural pests. And they have interesting names like tiger beetles, assassin bugs, uh, stiletto beetles, um, robber flies, all of those are shown here. Um, and they, they are basically predators of agricultural pests. So they'll eat either the larva or the adults of a lot of the pest species. And even the, in the center there, uh, ground beetles uh, serve a very important function of eating a lot of weed seeds. Uh, so so those, uh, that's a whole other group of species that are also important for us. And in many cases, it's not the adult of the uh, species that it serves the important function. In this case, on the right, there's the green lacewing and the lady beetle. It's actually the larva of those species uh, on the left-hand side, rather nasty looking uh, little larva that, uh, for example, feed on aphids. So uh, again, those are a lot of species that serve important functions in our agricultural landscapes. Uh, so there's, those are the predators. There's also parasites of agricultural pests. So these are species that will either uh, lay their eggs directly on uh, or in the, uh, in other pest species. Um, for example, the larvae or the caterpillars of pest species, they'll lay their eggs right in. Uh, there you can see a couple of the wasps doing that. Um, there's other species, tachnid flies, where the larvae of those species are parasitic on uh, other, other agricultural pests. So, so those are important uh, uh, and, and I'm kind of including them uh, along with pollinators, uh, as I'll mention, uh, in the slides coming up in the agricultural context, because that often is the landscapes where we work. <clears throat> so what, you know, what's the, what's the concern? Um, I suspect everybody uh, has heard of colony collapse disorder. Uh, this has been in the news a lot. It, it was in the news a lot in the mid uh, 2000s, 2006, 2007, when it first appeared. And uh, essentially what happened is that over a span of a year or two, uh, honeybee uh, over winter mortality went from a background level of about 10%, which, which had, was kind of considered normal, to about 30%. And it, that happened over a couple of years and it's been about 30% since. And it really caused obviously a lot of uh, consternation because uh, honeybees are so economically important. And, and nobody really knew why this all of a sudden uh, was happening. So that, uh, that really kind of raised the, raised the issue um, and sparked a lot of research into, you know, why, why was that happening with honeybees? But at the same time, there was also a lot of work uh, going on uh, with other, um, other pollinating species. And, uh, in 2016, uh, a study from the United Nations came out that did a global review of trends in pollinating species and what it might uh, mean for our economies and societies. And it sparked a lot of uh, mainstream media, media coverage. Um, this is one story from the Washington Post. The New York Times, of course, picked up on it as well. And about the same time, there were other uh, things cropping up. In, in this case, uh, there was actually a bumblebee in the US that was listed as endangered, the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, along about the same time in Europe, uh, there was a, you know, where they've had long-term monitoring programs of butterflies and other insects, uh, there was a alarm raised about the decline of butterflies. And, and that, uh, you know, has kind of continued and actually, uh, again, in 2017, 
an article appeared in the New York Times uh, based on another article that, that had been uh, uh, published looking at uh, the number of insects recorded in nature reserves in Germany. And that showed a 75% decline in a whole suite of species in that area. So um, <clears throat> certainly from 2006 forward, there's been a lot of attention paid uh, to not only pollinators, but insects in general. Uh, it's really been an evolving issue as people have begun looking at data sets and trying to track what's happening. It, uh, it has culminated in you know, major stories in all of the major media outlets, uh, Time Magazine. This uh, cover from National Geographic was May of this year. And uh, from April of this year, the cover of Science was uh, Science Magazine, which is one of the major scientific uh, publications, was de devoted to in the insect de decline as well. So <clears throat> this is a this is a real a real issue, and it has important consequences not only for pollination and, and our food supply, but for ecosystems. Because in the words of E.O. Wilson, uh, who is a world-renowned uh, uh, ecologist, uh, insects are the little the little things that run the world. The report I mentioned uh, from the United Nations came out from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, it was a report on pollinations, pollination and, and, and food production. And a couple of statements here I've highlighted are, you know, wild pollinators Pollinators have declined in occurrence and diversity and abundance for many species at local and regional scales in Northwestern Europe and North America. The abundance, diversity, and health of pollinators and the provision of pollination are threatened by direct drivers that generate risks to societies and ecosystems. And that some of the threats that were identified include land use change, intensive agricultural management and pesticide use, environmental pollution, invasive alien species, pathogens, and climate change. And in many cases, uh, often a lot of these factors can interact, in some cases, synergistically. So um, it's a broad suite of causative factors. And, and uh, you know, we're still, I think, trying to figure out exactly, uh, exactly which ones are most important and what we can do about them. But this report goes on to talk about some solutions, which I'll talk about in a minute. But kind of concurrent with all of this uh, discussion about insect decline, um, some of you may, may have noticed in, uh, in the media recently, I think earlier this year, late last year, um, there was an article in Science that really highlighted the decline in North American birds. Um, and it's been referred to as the Three Billion Birds Report. Uh, it documented a uh, decline Based on, based on survey data of about 3 billion birds in North America since 1970. Uh, and it's not too much of a stretch because given the linkages between insects and birds, that most birds, even, even the ones that are feed mainly on seeds, often feed their young insects. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, we'll go to some questions. Um, but that's kind of the, the concern, the level of concern, the trends that have been noted in, in, the, uh, in the insect population, related declines potentially in birds. And, uh, and that's really the case or the, uh, the situation before us. And it has major potential impacts on ecosystems and ecological systems worldwide. So open up for questions there. Uh, Great. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, remember, if you have questions, uh, please use your, your chat box. And, and maybe one um, question that I had for you, Jim. So we've had, uh, we've had lots of media attention. Um, so any tips on what like a regular person who has a regular backyard garden or flower bed, what can they do to help assist pollinators? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question, I think everybody. <laughs> Uh, who's aware of the problem is looking for ways to help out. And um, 
you know, urban, urban gardens are actually a very important uh, uh, source of resources for a lot of different pollinators, uh, from bumblebees to honeybees to all of the other native bees that occur in urban areas. And so planting, uh, planting flowering plants, especially, you know, a group of flowering plants that uh, flower at different times throughout the season is, is good because you're providing resources for uh, these species kind of right throughout the year. Um, and also paying attention when, uh, uh, when you're purchasing plants from greenhouses. Uh, often uh, if you buy a plant that's previously potted from a greenhouse, uh, many greenhouses uh, use uh, uh, seed treatments or systemic pesticides. So they'll, they're in the soil, they get taken up in all parts of the uh, potted plant. And, and the nectar and the pollen can actually be toxic to many pollinators. So um, searching out greenhouses that have, uh, have uh, non-systemic uh, pesticides in their plants is something that can be done. Great, great. And we do have a question from Jeannie Golix in the, in the chat. And her question is, what is the impact of herbicides, so aquatic glyphosate, being used for Phragmites eradication? What's the impact of that on pollinators? Or do yeah. we know? <laughs> I, well, yeah, in that specific in that specific instance, I am I'm not I'm not sure. I haven't seen any uh, any uh, research specifically on that. Um, certainly, glyphosate and its eradication of a lot of, for example, milkweeds in, in the Midwest of the U.S. has been tied to uh, some of the monarch uh, butterfly declines. Um, uh, and yeah, so, but specific to the use on Phragmites, I, I'm not sure. Okay, great. I think we have uh, time for one more. So Justin asks, is uh, starting a home apiary beneficial to pollinators? I guess expanding on the backyard garden question. Yeah. Actually, a few years ago, I started a hive myself and I had a hive for, I had a, hive for a couple of years and, and honeybees are really, I mean, they're obviously amazing, amazing insects, their social structure and, and all of that. I really enjoyed having them. Um, they died during one winter, uh, oh. and I, I, I haven't uh, resurrected them. But um, you know, again, I mentioned that the, the European honeybee is not a native species to North America, and where you have honeybees, they compete with all of the native pollinators that are in the areas, the bumblebees, the, the sweat bees, the mason bees, etc. Um, so it's not something that I necessarily would, in, would encourage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's not to say that a hive here or two would cause that big a problem. Right. All right. Um, so one of the things we started during, doing during our last masterclass was, was a series of poll questions uh, so the audience can be a little bit more participatory. So I'll ask Sean to bring up our first poll question which is how many species of bumblebees are there in North America? Let's see some variety there. All right, we'll maybe end that poll, um, Sean. Great, and so uh, many of you were paying attention to Jim. The answer is uh, 46 species of bumblebees in North America. So congratulations, everyone. Um, Jim, maybe we'll uh, continue with your presentation. Okay, and, and 4,000 species of bees uh, in North America. If anybody ever questions you on that factor. <laughs> Okay, just getting back to my screen here. Can everybody see that? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Okay, so I, <clears throat> I ended up talking about that uh, UN report on uh, pollination and pollination services. Um, they also, in that report, provided some 
recommendations for solutions. And, and one of those was investing in ecological infrastructure by protecting, restoring, and connecting patches of natural and semi-natural habitats throughout productive agricultural landscapes. And another was actions to enhance pollination on intensive farmland, also enhance other ecosystem services, including natural pest regulation. So we're hitting both aspects here of uh, both the pollination, um, habitat restoration and preservation for, for pollination, but also recognizing that that also benefits a lot of the natural pest regulation. And, and this, is, this, is, this is what we do. This is our wheelhouse. Uh, we, on a day-to-day -day basis, we protect, restore, and connect patches of natural and semi-natural habitats throughout productive agricultural landscapes. The prairie pothole region of North America uh, is one of the highest uh, intensity agricultural regions in the world. And uh, that's where a lot of ducks settle because of the wetlands, uh, but it's also an area that has a lot of potential for pollination and beneficial insect um, uh, benefits. So we're out there every day, this is what we do. And trying to get a handle on that uh, in a way that we can quantify it and understand the benefits of what we do to pollinators is really what, uh, <clears throat> what this, is, uh, this all, is all about and I'll talk about in a moment. As I mentioned, the prairie pothole region is where we do uh, a lot of our work, our investments in habitat. Uh, this is an example of a patch of prairie pothole habitat. Lots of pothole wetlands, as you can see, attract lots of ducks. Um, this landscape actually has uh, remaining habitat that is beneficial, not only to waterfowl, but also for these other species. Most of these species uh, require undisturbed soil for their nests. So don't think of you know, bees nesting in hives like the honeybee. Uh, most bee species are solitary and they, their nests are often in holes in the ground that they excavate themselves or, or find from other uh, uh, burrowing, burrowing animals. Like for bumblebees use uh, burrows from other animals. So <clears throat> uh, areas that have undisturbed soil uh, and and lots of flowering plants are great habitats for, for uh, pollinating insects. And you can see in this photo, in the center there, there's a patch of, it looks like native habitat that has never been cultivated with some wetlands in it. The greener patch there is a, a hay field. Um, so it's been planted back to grass uh, and the soil is generally undisturbed. Both of those habitats provide great nesting habitat for ducks. Uh, but they also provide great habitat, not only nesting habitats, but also for resources for uh, pollinators. <clears throat> As agricultural intensity increases, uh, you begin to lose a lot of those remnant patches of habitat. Here's a, a landscape that is a bit more along the gradient of intensity. Uh, you still have wetlands present, but a lot of the remaining vegetation patches have declined. And in a worst case scenario uh, where you see a lot of wetland drainage, uh, which is occurring across the prairie pothole region, uh, channelized uh, interconnected channels that link up wetlands and drain them off the landscape. And once the wet water is gone, all of the remaining vegetation is turned into uh, cropland as well. All disturbed soil, not great habitat for pollination, pollinators or beneficial insects. Well, you know, what uh, most of the research that has been done in trying to quantify what these kind of landscape level impact, uh, uh, impacts have on pollinators uh, has occurred in Europe. And obviously the landscapes there are, and how agricultural is, is done, is quite different than the prairie uh, Canada or prairie uh, US context. So, um, understanding how the results uh, translate from European studies to Canadian studies is, or to the Canadian landscape is really uh, not optimal. So that was one of the reasons we wanted to begin some of the research that uh, we've done in the Canadian prairie context to begin quantifying uh, what these impacts might look like. So 
in uh, in 2016 with a, uh, a generous grant uh, from uh, uh, Bob Pushniak, we initiated some of this work through the University of Calgary, uh, Dr. Paul Galpern. And, and it's really uh, focused on looking at the diversity and abundance of beneficial insects, including pollinators, in the Canadian prairie eco agroecosystem and understanding how these remnant habitats uh, that remain impact their populations, both in terms of abundance and diversity. So our objectives uh, overall were to quantify uh, how these uh, habitats affect abundance and diversity with a focus with a focus on wetlands, both natural wetlands that are occurring in the landscape as well as wetlands that we've restored. Grasslands, both native remaining native prairie grasslands, but also tame grasslands that have been seeded back from cropland. Uh, we do a lot of that as part of our habitat program for ducks and often that habitat can be used for hay or pasture and some of it remains idle. So it's idle grassland um, and, and which is really good for nesting waterfowl. But we also wanted to see, you know, what, what's happening in the croplands themselves and how they relate uh, to uh, the remaining natural habitats that are embedded within them. And this is, this is kind of a classic example. Um, if you think of a high density wetlands that, that are the prairie pothole region, you get these wetlands embedded often within agricultural fields. Uh, and, and sometimes they have a, a good margin around them of undisturbed habitat, which uh, has grass and flowering plants. In other cases, it's, it's uh, less so. But in all cases, they are one of the few remaining habitats that are left within crop fields. So we were interested in, in this idea that, uh, that these wetlands can serve as reservoirs for pollinators and beneficial insects within croplands and, and postulated or hypothesized almost this halo effect where uh, you know, there'll be populations of, of these species within the wetland margin and they'll provide benefits and occur uh, in out into the surrounding agricultural land where they can have benefits to producers. So that was a, a germ of the idea that we initially started working on with Paul Galpern at the University of Calgary. And our study design was such that we uh, went in and, and sampled the, what, uh, the pollinator uh, community right within the wetland edge and then at different distances out into the surrounding cropland. Uh, 25 meters and 75 meters. It was later expanded out to 200 meters, but in our initial study, it was out to 75 meters. And again, we did this, repeated this sample uh, sampling scheme seven times in native prairie, seven times in wheat fields, and seven times in canola fields. And this is just an example of what those transects uh, look like. Uh, we had a transect from the wetland going out into the crop field in red. And we also had uh, a transect from the cropland edge, uh, from the road ditch edge, uh, which had habitat out into the crop field as well as kind of a comparison. So when you're, when you're sampling uh, pollinate, pollinators and beneficial insects, there are fairly standard techniques that you use. And uh, there are pan traps where you, where you put out uh, pans of different colors and you put ethyl alcohol in those pans, insects are attracted to the colors and they get caught in the alcohol and you come along every, uh, every five days and collect the insects out of that. Um, so there's pan traps. This blue vein trap in the lower right is really good at catching bumblebees. Um, for the beneficial insects, for example, spiders and ground beetles, there are pitfall traps which you bury in the ground. They walk along and they fall into it in the upper left there. And then there are other uh, types as well, sticky traps, which are just uh, you know, insects fly into them and get stuck on them. So that's kind of a suite of the different methods that we, we used. Our study sites uh, in the Canadian Prairie Pothole region were near Calgary initially, uh, expanded that up towards uh, Edmonton and 
in 2018, we began doing similar work uh, just north and uh, east of Saskatoon through the University of Saskatchewan. This is what a, a sample a station would look like with the blue vein trap and sticky cards in the left. In the center, a pitfall trap with a little cage over it to keep uh, mammals, uh, small mammals, mice, etc., from falling in. And on the far right, the uh, pan traps. Just a close up of what those look like and what, what some of the collection, <laughs> collection of insects looks like. And again, we had these set out at different distances into the surrounding crop fields. Uh, just an example of a canola set and a wheat uh, set as well. As I mentioned, we did the sampling in Ducks Unlimited restored grasslands. Here is a, uh, uh, a sampling set up in a restored grassland. Um, I believe this was an idle grassland, so it uh, remained undisturbed for, uh, from either haying or grazing for uh, several years. And this was work was done in University of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> Just another example here in a, in a field edge situation. So every five days, typically, uh, we visit these traps and collect all of the, all of the little insects that have been uh, captured in them. And, and those are uh, uh, pictured here. We filter them and reset the traps. All of the insects that are collected are brought back to uh, back to the lab at the university, and and this is where most of the most of the work and expense and time in this study occurs. Uh, the field work is really the nice part about it, the easy part, if you will. If you think about it, uh, if you're collecting all of those insects, you have to bring them back to the lab, and each each individual has to be identified, ideally to to genus and species. So it's, uh, you, you, need, uh, you need staff that are good taxonomists and specialists of the, in the different types of insects that you're, you're looking at. And it's a great uh, way for, uh, for, for university students to gain experience in entomology. And, and uh, so it's a great training, training ground as well. And, and uh, to give you an idea of the volume of samples that we've collected, uh, I think the University of Calgary alone, we have close to 500,000 uh, individual specimens that we've collected over the, uh, the span of our work. This is just an example of a kind of a small component of that, uh, a lot of the bumblebees in the trays on the left, and each one of these gets uh, pinned and labeled and goes into the permanent uh, museum collection at the University of Calgary. And just uh, an example of some of the neat little species and, and obviously the different coloration and unusual uh, different species. When I began this work, I had no idea the diversity of bees that were, bees that were out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at that point in, point in time here, we'll Break Great. again for questions. Great. Any other um, any questions from anyone? I'm just going to check the chat box. Um, so, Jim, you've mentioned there's a lot of uh, species out there. Have you identified any new species throughout this program? Yeah. Well, well that's a really good. That's a really good question. Um, you know, the, day, the days of uh, these really big inventory type studies of, of biology are really, they seem to be in the past. So the identification of new species, a lot of that, you know, occurred way back when and hasn't been much done since. This, you know, whenever you enter a big sampling study like this, the potential to identify new species is there. Um, we haven't identified any new species so far. Uh, that said, uh, there's still a lot of our sampling that has yet to be identified down to species. So what happens is uh, these taxonomists they look at look at the different samples we've collected. If if they can't uh, immediately identify it down to species, they'll set it aside and it'll go to a specialist uh, to be identified. Um, one of those specialists is at the uh, uh, Saskatchewan Museum of Natural History in Regina, uh, Corey Sheffield. Um, 
in other sampling that he was doing this past summer, I believe he found a new species uh, of bee. Uh, I think it was in Saskatchewan. So it, uh, it can happen. Uh, we have, there are in Canada, there are a couple of different uh, endangered bee species that, uh, that we have found a few samples of those. So um, yeah, long-winded long -winded answer to a simple question. <laughs> Great. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. One I wanted to, um, I had thought of earlier too. Uh, I know that you work a lot with the landowners obviously and, and farmers to gain access to their property and stuff. So what's your experience in their knowledge or hmm. awareness of the decline in, in pollinators across the country? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a really <clears throat> a really good question and interesting an interesting one. Uh, in in 2016, when when we first set out to do the field sampling, um, I went out and talked to a lot of the uh, landowners southeast of Calgary, uh, where we'd identified wetlands that we wanted to work on in their crop fields, and I really I really didn't know what what to expect, um, uh, but it was really interesting almost to a landowner. As soon as I mentioned that you know we're interested in in sampling pollinators, uh, bees on your property, uh, almost to a one they said, yeah, yeah, you know we don't see as many bees as we used to. Um, so it it it's of a magnitude that is that for people working on the land, it's pretty, it's obvious. And you know most of the these folks have been operating on the land for a long period of time and and had the experience uh, to be able to compare over time. And I know just from my, my own personal experience, <clears throat> you know, going to the farm in Saskatchewan every year from Calgary, uh, you know, I used to have to clean the windshield every time we stopped for gas. And, <clears throat> and, and the windshield was always full of bugs. I can drive from Winnipeg to Calgary today and not have to clean my windshield. So uh, that's a, personal experience of, yeah, things have changed. Great, not for the better. All right. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions, but thanks, John, for your comment. And uh, I think, uh, Jim, let's uh, wrap it up with the, the rest of your presentation. And we'll have some more questions at the uh, time for questions at the end as well. OK, very good. <clears throat> Is my screen back up? Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, without further ado, we'll dive kind of right into some of the uh, some of the results uh, and and maybe where we're we're going from here. Um, <clears throat> this is a, just a, a sample. You know, I, I showed that graphic of the halo effect with uh, you know this projected bee abundance as you move out from a out from a wetland. Well, um, you know, we we were doing this study in wheat fields, canola fields, and as expected, um, we, we actually did see a decline in abundance uh, in bees as you moved away from the wetland embedded in the crop field. Uh, comparatively, in the grasslands that we studied, uh, there wasn't really that, that effect. No matter how far we got away from the wetland, we were still finding the same number of bees, which again, as, you, as you'd expect, uh, bees are central place foragers, so they'll nest and forage in one area and move out from that area. Um, so, you know, bees nesting in the wetland edge uh, are going to mainly forage in the wetland edge and occasionally move out. The larger bees will move further. The honeybees, the uh, uh, bumblebees will move further out into the cropland, but a lot of the smaller species will remain very close. So this was somewhat, <clears throat> somewhat expected. Uh, and this work we, we published uh, last year in the journal of Biological Conservation. Um, one of the other aspects of that study that was novel, we weren't expecting, was when you look at the community of species that we identified in croplands, uh, circled in yellow here, versus the community of bees that we uh, found in the grasslands, they were really quite distinct. So a different group of species in the croplands, different group of species in the grasslands, which 
which again, I, I think uh, points to the value of uh, you know, a lot of the grassland conservation work we do in maintaining that community of bees within agricultural uh, ecosystems. Oops. Okay. So, uh, you know, the other aspect that we identified in this study was that, you know, fairly basic information, but there were 133 different bee species uh, that we identified associated with uh, wetlands uh, in our study in, in association with, uh, with the croplands and the grasslands. So we're beginning to get an idea of, of kind of what that diversity, what that diversity looks like. And you know, the bumblebees obviously were uh, a big one, but again, a lot of different uh, species of all different shapes and sizes that, uh, that we found. So what, you know, what's some of the anticipated benefit of this uh, work for ducks and liniment? Uh, well, we believe that quantifying the relationships between these remnant habitats and the diversity and abundance of pollinators and beneficial insects will, number one, uh, inform the potential value of these habitats, especially these habitats remaining in, in uh, agricultural lands for the pollination and pest control services to the agricultural community. And just by way, by way of an example, um, this was work that was done in 2006 in Northern Alberta, but they showed that you know, number one, there, there is at a landscape level in an agricultural landscape in Alberta, uh, a relationship between bee abundance and the amount of remaining uh, non-cropland habitat in the surrounding landscape. Uh, but they took it a step further and they looked at, okay, how does that bee abundance affect the ability of canola, which is one of the most profitable and widespread crops grown in Prairie Canada, uh, how does that affect the, uh, the ability of canola plants to fill the seed pod and greater pollination, they'll have greater filling of the seed pods. Well, they found that when bee abundance was low, uh, the plants weren't being able to fill the seed pods as much. And, and canola is a, a wind, a wind pollinated uh, plant, but uh, having bees around will actually augment uh, the production and filling of the seed pods. So they made, they made that linkage and they took it one step further to kind of estimate on a profit return to the producer, how much uncultivated land in the landscape do they need to kind of maximize that profit? And they came up with about 33%. So that was an interesting kind of, you know, big picture look at how this relationship between remnant habitats remaining in the landscape might benefit producers in a crop that is one of the most profitable for Canadian farmers. Um, this information also allows us to quantify our impact on conserving these ecologically and economically important species. So um, with, you know, without this information in hand, it's hard for us to say, hey, the work that we're doing is really benefiting the conservation of these, these important species. So it benefits us that way. And it also f facilitates our ability to communicate this new set of wetland associated ecosystem services to urban and rural audiences. And that is, uh, is really important in terms of broadening the support uh, from the general public uh, and the producers for the work that we, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis for waterfowl. And where are we, where are we kind of going uh, forward? Uh, with this information? Well, it's really about leveraging our knowledge uh, about the benefits of waterfowl habitat um, to these other species. And we're using that in the promotion, for example, of our marginal areas program, a program that was launched last year. And it's, uh, you know, its main focus is uh, converting agricultural croplands that are marginally producing, uh, meaning they, uh, for various reasons, it might be a saline area around the wetland, that, that producers are basically losing money on, on, uh, on farming those, converting those lands back to, uh, back to grasslands, augmented with, uh, with floral resources like uh, alfalfa and a suite of other uh, flowering plants, um, you know, providing, providing that, uh, 
you know, that habitat will likely provide benefits to the surrounding cropland, while at the same time uh, reducing the expenditure by the producer in lands that aren't producing uh, for them. It also allows us to promote our wetland and grassland conservation programs for the role in pollination and beneficial insect conservation and the promotion of the potential values of wetlands and grasslands as part of an environmentally sustainable crop production system. Uh, more and more, uh, it seems that uh, the general public society is beginning to pay attention to how their croplands are produced, what the environmental impacts are, and understanding how uh, the preservation work uh, and restoration work that we do uh, feeds into providing those environmentally sustainable uh, landscapes in highly cropped landscapes is uh, is valuable. So all in all, this kind of uh, feeds into uh, this idea that you know we're we're supporting this these prairie agricultural landscapes that we all recognize uh, are they'll always be an intensive agricultural production, um, but making them a part of an environmentally sustainable food production system in which waterfowl other species and people can thrive is really, uh, you know, an ideal, an ideal goal here. Um, and, and having this information in our uh, in our back pocket really helps us uh, achieve this. So, um, I'll end, end it there and open it to questions. So maybe before we get into questions, um, I'll ask Sean to bring up the the next poll question. So how many specimens are in the collection at the University of Calgary? <laughs> Give it a few more seconds. Great. And it is about half a million. <laughs> People are listening. Great. Um, so we do have a, a few more minutes for questions before we wrap up at the top of the hour. If anyone has uh, anything, please put it in the chat. Um, and then Jim, just while we're waiting for everyone to, to collect their thoughts and their questions, uh, one for me is, is how do you plan to, uh, what are your plans to communicate the results of the research so that it really makes a difference for uh, not only those of us who, who work in conservation, but for people like the landowners you work with or the general public? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, certainly, I mean, one of our main focuses initially will be just uh, publishing a lot of our work in uh, the scientific uh, literature, getting it uh, out there and peer reviewed. Um, but we, you know, we have enough information right now that, uh, you know, getting a uh, uh, communicating this this work to the agricultural community, um, and and having you know, land landowners and uh, agricultural producers really kind of understand it and understand the benefits of of keeping these uh, uh, these habitats on the ground. Um, you, you know, there's there's several different ways that we can we can do that through uh, popular media, um, and and meeting with different ag producer groups. Uh, we have had a fair bit of interest, for example, from the Panola Council in Canada uh, uh, in, in, in this work and the results of it. And, and they generally recognize the value of having, uh, uh, having these habitats remain on the ground. So <clears throat> I think the, uh, the you know, future is fairly bright, especially uh, if we can begin again linking into sustainable food production messaging, um, because the you know the benefits are fairly clear in that regard. Great. So we had a, a question from from Terry. I think you partially answered it, Jim, but I'll uh, I'll ask it anyways. Uh, his question is, how can we possibly win over the profit-minded corporate farming community? So I think you touched on that a little bit, but if there's anything more. On that, he mentions you know agriculture and and high yield methods, larger machinery, that kind of things. Um, yeah. Anything to add on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, those are yeah, obviously all major 
uh, issues that we've, we've, you know, those are the issues we've been dealing with and, and, and uh, working with uh, for years. Um, and I think, you know, ideally, uh, kind of standing alongside agricultural producers and looking to a future where uh, the landscape serves not only food production and, and keeping rural communities and producers in production, uh, but also maintaining all of the ecosystem services that the habitats that we uh, are focused on for waterfowl, um, you know, that's, I think we can, I think we can do that. And I think the environment and the, uh, um, the attitudes of society are moving that way. So I think as time goes on, we'll be able to make those alignments much easier. Great. And I did have another question uh, from Suzanne. Uh, she asks, what separates the, the bees, um, the species? Is it how they look or, or is it their activity or sort of their yeah. nesting habits and those kinds of things? Yeah, well, well, it's all of those, and often they're they're kind of inter inter intertwined and interrelated. Um, uh, you know, in many cases, individual bees uh, feed on uh, individual types of plants. Uh, certain flowering plants or bee species that specialize on them, um, and you know, it's it's size, it's 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 all of that. Uh, you know, each each species kind of evolves into its its uh, ecological niches, as we call them, yeah. uh, where they specialize uh, to minimize competition with other species, and that might be by changing color, by changing shape, um, and by changing behavior. All of that. I'm not sure I answered the question, but but it, it's. Uh, yeah, each, each species really has its its own little role within the, the functioning ecosystem. Great, great. I'll maybe ask uh, uh, Sean to, to pull up. We've got uh, two more poll questions and then we'll wrap up this evening. How many bee species are associated with prairie wetlands? Great. Again, lots of people listening. That's awesome. Uh, the answer is 133. Excellent. So thank you very much. Uh, oh, yes, we had one more question. Sorry. Uh, have you ever been stung by a bee? Lots of us who work outside, we, we know what this answer is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of variation there. Um, so thank you very much, Jim. Uh, our, certainly our foray into pollinator research really solidifies to me our, our commitment uh, to creating a better environment uh, for all sorts of species across Canada, not, uh, not just waterfowl. So that's awesome. Um, and uh, Jim had mentioned uh, Dr. Paul Galpern earlier. Uh, if any of you were at Prairie Experience last, uh, last summer in Calgary, uh, he gave a very enthusiastic presentation about the work that he's doing on those uh, those sites that Jim mentioned, uh, his enthusiasm for pollinators was was really inspiring. And so, uh, thanks again, Jim, for, for all of this, and thanks again to all of you. Uh, I see some great comments in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules. I know everyone is um, zoomed out on uh, Zoom meetings, and uh, hopefully, uh, we didn't miss any of your questions. Uh, if we did, or if you have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to, to contact one of us. We'll make sure we get, uh, get you answered. And this uh, recording will be available as well. So we'll get that out to folks who 
uh, were able to be on the call tonight. And those of, uh, we have several folks who were not able to be on. So thank you again for all you do for wetland conservation. Have a fabulous evening and the rest of your week. I hope everything goes well. Thanks very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you.